So let's jump into the topic of polygons um, and start off with a definition. Now, I, I think polygons fall into this category where it's sort of like you know it when you see it. You know what a polygon is um, just by looking at it. Um, and actually, the, the precise definition of a polygon is actually controversial, believe it or not. Um, this textbook says, a polygon is a closed region of the plane bounded by a finite collection of line segments forming a closed curve that does not intersect itself. Um, now, the latter part of this definition, the, um, the avoidance of self-intersection is really important, um, especially if you're, if you're sort of running a custom algorithm, and part of that algorithm requires you to calculate things like surface area or to plot the polygon, because in those cases, um, often algorithms will be quite sensitive to the order of points that you've provided to it. Um, so you'll see here in, in my code, when I'm defining two different polygons, um, one I've named a uh, self-intersection vertices because it, it self-intersects on, on purpose. Um, but you see I've carefully labeled the, the vertices, so top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left. Just be really careful to, to, make, sure that, uh, to make sure that I know which vertex is where so that I can avoid uh, self-intersection in this case. And then for demonstration purposes, I'm actually going to swap two of the vertices um, so that we have a self-intersection event um, just to see what happens there. Um, now, matplotlib has these polygon objects, which I've imported uh, at the top level of this Jupyter notebook. Those are quite useful. There are patches that you can add to the, to the, to the plot, um, to plot polygons in two dimensions. Um, there are also patch collections, which are sometimes a little bit faster if you need to plot a really large number of polygons uh, simultaneously in a given plot. Um, now, let's take a look at, uh, so if we just rerun this code, just to be sure it's working, and it is, um, we have the example of the, of the good polygon, the power polygon, and the self-intersection uh, violation so that this object over here is not a polygon. Um, now, just in terms of terminology, you may know this, but basically the, the line segments are, are formally called edges on polygons, and the corners are called uh, vertices, and we generally assume that a vertex is a corner, so you can't have, for example, a 180-degree flat angle at, at a vertex, um, so you don't have three lines that are collinear, um, so vertex, vertex, and then there's an angle, and then there's another vertex. So that's typically how you would define a vertex. Um, now, another uh, point of interest, if you're working in computer graphics, or even with a lot of the general algorithms that, that are typically used day to day in computational geometry, there's often a need to know whether a point falls with inside, uh, within a polygon. So if you measure a point that's uh, outside of the polygon here, one po and there are actually more than one algorithm um, that, that can tackle this problem, but one sort of way to visualize it is if you have a, a polygon that starts from my cursor, or a point that starts from my per where my cursor is here, and you imagine a line that is not parallel to any edge in the polygon, so you draw through the polygon with that imaginary line, the number of times that you cross that polygon is diagnostic. So again, if we start with a point around here where the mouse cursor is, we move to the top left, we cross the polygon once here, and then we cross it a second time near the side over here. That's an even number of crossings, so two crossings. But if we imagine another point that's within the polygon, so say where the mouse cursor is now, and go, with, go along a line that's again not parallel to any of the edges in the current polygon, if we go in roughly the same direction, we'll only cross the polygon once. That's an odd number of crossings. So the sort of even versus odd number of crossings with these lines for, for different points, whether they're inside or outside of the polygon, um, this is actually a sort of an early insight into, or a sort of a simplistic insight into how one of the algorithms, one of the possible algorithms to um, point inside polygon algorithms actually work. Um, there are others that use uh, clockwise versus counterclockwise um, uh, calculations, but this is just a, a really simple example of how that sort of thing can work if you want to check if a point is inside a polygon. It turns out that within the Python uh, ecosystem, there's at least one way to do this with a, a well-established library, which is the matplotlib library. So it has um, a point, you can use its paths feature to, to determine if, if a point or a set of points are within a given polygon. Now it turns out that every single valid polygon, and this may surprise you, every single valid polygon has a triangulation. And of course, that's quite useful. Um, so if you wanted to calculate the surface area of a really complicated polygon, one possible strategy would be to break it down into triangles, since they can all be broken down into triangles, and then sum together the areas of those triangles programmatically and estimate the area of your polygon. 
Um, so just some useful definitions here. Um, a diagonal, I think this is a fairly obvious thing again, you know, sort of you know it when you see it, um, but it's a line segment connecting two vertices, so two corners of the polygon. Um, it's always in the interior of P, it can't exit the polygon, um, and it only touches the perimeter of the polygon, shown as delta P here, um, except at its endpoints. Um, so for this square up here, we would have one vertex could go, or one diagonal could go from this vertex here down at the top, to the bottom right, and another one from the vertex on the bottom left to the top right. So two possible diagonals um, for, this, for this polygon. Now a triangulation is just basically um, a decomposition of a polygon into triangles as you might expect. Um, and again, note that the diagonals can't cross. So it's a maximal set of non-crossing diagonals that splits the polygon into, into triangles. Um, so I have these interactive examples here. Set these up. Um, so this is, this is a sort of an interactive, a visualization-based way to say, uh, you know, prove to me that uh, you know, every polygon can be triangulated. Now, I won't prove it rigorously, but I will show for that for these two cases. So these are both polygons with four vertices, but they're actually quite different polygons with four vertices. But there's a very intuitive way to show that for any polygon with, with four vertices, any valid polygon with four vertices, there is a possible triangulation. And the basic strategy is as follows. So you start out with the bottommost vertex in your polygon. So for the polygon on the left, that's the one down here where the mouse cursor is. Now what you do is then you then look at the, the two neighboring vertices for that vertex. So there's one neighbor to the left up here, and another neighbor up to the right over here. Now what you want to do is you want to connect those two neighboring vertices with a line. And that line is then sort of shift it up from the bottom of the polygon, as I show here. So let's start moving it up a little bit. So moving it up, moving it up a bit more. So again, this line is parallel to the line that would intersect the two neighboring vertices. In this case, I've made life a little bit easier by making sure that that line is exactly horizontal, but it certainly doesn't have to be. So we'll keep moving up until we encounter a new vertex. So keep going, keep going. 0 0.7, 0 0.9, 1 0.0. So now we've encountered uh, the new vertices, which happen to be the vertices that were used for um, the original assignment of the, the slope of the line. And we can see that because this diagonal, this line is a valid diagonal, um, we're basically done. So now we've broken our four vertex polygon into two three vertex polygons, or two triangles, and we've shown that this polygon can be triangulated. Now the case on the right with this second polygon is a little bit more complicated, but the same algorithm can, can apply. So despite the fact that it has a, it's concave, it has the invagination on the top, we still just look at the two neighboring vertices. So the, the vertex on the left, the left neighbor is up here, the right neighbor is up here, and again they have the same parallel line. And we're going to just start sliding that line up from the bottommost vertex, so slide it up, slide it up work our way up to about 0.7, I think it is. There we go. So here we've stopped in a different position because the first vertex we've encountered isn't one of the neighbors. And so what we do now is we connect the first vertex we've encountered with the vertex that we started with. And so I've just added a little a widget check, check box here, which will draw the new line segment in. And we can see that this is a valid diagonal. And so that means that we have these two triangles. So again, two polygons with the three vertices from the original four vertex polygon. So again, we have a triangulation with the same number of vertices as the case on the left, but with a very different polygon. And now just you know, try to imagine any polygon with four vertices. So you, you could take this vertex here, for example, shift it to the right and shift it to the left. It's really not that hard to imagine, at least I don't think it's that hard to imagine, that you can still draw a line from that vertex down to the bottommost vertex and produce two triangles. Now, there'll be two different triangles from this symmetric case here, but they'll still be valid triangles. Um, so it's, it's possible to use slightly more formal language than I'm using now, um, use things like mathematical induction arguments to basically formally prove that for any polygon, any valid polygon with any number of vertices that you can imagine, it's always going to be possible to triangulate it. Now, it's also useful to note that when you go to three dimensions, as you might expect, things get a bit more complicated. 
So the three-dimensional equivalent of the polygon is the polyhedron. The simplest polygon is the triangle with three vertices and three edges. The simplest polyhedron is the tetrahedron, which has the triangular base. Now it turns out that not all, not all polyhedra can be tetrahedralized. Um, there's, a, there's several examples of, of, uh, of polyhedra that can't be tetrahedralized. Um, the simplest and most famous example is called the Schoenhardt uh, polyhedron, um, named after the mathematician who um, discovered that this polyhedron could not be tetrahedralized. Um, but that's an important sort of thing to, to keep in mind. So although you can break a polygon down into its constituent triangles to calculate its area, which isn't the only way to calculate area, but it is one way to, to estimate the area of a polygon. But if you move into a three-dimensional context with polyhedra, um, it's, it's good to keep in mind that, that things actually aren't, um, aren't, aren't quite as straightforward as, as in the two-dimensional uh, polygon case. So, okay, so maybe I haven't formally proven, but hopefully I've at least um, convinced you that intuitively it makes sense that every polygon has a triangulation based on the sort of simple uh, line sliding algorithm above. Um, now, it turns out that we also know, so the, this can also be shown formally, that every triangulation of a polygon with a given number of vertices has n minus two triangles and also one less than that number uh, Diagonals, so it has n minus three diagonals and n minus two triangles. Um, so let's just take a look at uh, actually a real-world example. So I've, I've taken one example, which is um, the geography of Oregon, so the perimeter of Oregon, and we're going to deal with a shape file here. Um, now it turns out that this is the sort of the GIS, the Geographic Information System. Uh, ecosystem, their sort of software and data format ecosystem is a little bit involved as a sort of mixture of open source and proprietary tools that are used in that field. Um, and I've used this uh, shapefile Python library, uh, which is available from the Python uh, package index. And I've basically used it to load in these, these shape files. Um, I've basically looked for Oregon within the metadata. So they have the sort of the, the metadata is combined with the coordinate data. So just looking for that string in the shape records and then pulling out the array of coordinates for the, the boundary, the perimeter of Oregon. Um, and then basically once I've extracted that, I'm just converting that into a, to a, to a NumPy array and right here and then sorting out the number of uh, vertices. So here there are 214 vertices, um, each with an X and a Y coordinate. So this data is actually, uh, of course, for something on the surface of the Earth, but it's being approximated um, to, uh, uh, to an approximately planar uh, situation. So this is sort of projected data. Now, I also thought it would be uh, useful to have a broad range of examples if, if I'm going to try to show you that, yes, in fact, not only for a real-world case, but also for a sort of much more potentially pathological case, that there are n minus two vertices uh, for, for any given polygon that you can think up. Um, so this is actually the 65,537 gone which has a lot of corners, obviously a lot of edges and a lot of vertices. Um, and it was actually worked on by the mathematician Hermes for 10 years in a 200 page manuscript. Um, and for a regular polyhedron of that size, or sorry, for a regular polygon of that size, you can imagine that it basically looks like a, a circle to the naked eye because it is in fact, um, it just has so many uh, 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 vertices. So we're gonna plot these. And again, I've, I've put one of these, these interaction widgets so that we can do a little bit of work. Um, on these polygons. So here you can see that that 65,537 gone does indeed look like a circle. It absolutely is not a circle. It's just a polygon with a lot of uh, edges and a lot of vertices. Um, and there's also the, uh, the perimeter of Oregon, which does in fact look like uh, Oregon if you were to look it up online. Um, so let's, I have this code which, which uses, again, this uses the triangle library, um, which is written by, I think I made a note up here, yeah, Jonathan, uh, Shuchuk at, at, at UC Berkeley. He's a, a Canadian professor at UC Berkeley. Uh, this is a warning, award-winning library, so it's um, a really well-known library, really robust library for constrained triangulations. Um, later, we'll, we'll use SciPy at Spatial to perform triangulations on uh, point, point sets, but when you want to constrain the triangulation to, to the space of a given polygon, so not a point set, but a polygon, um, you're often better off using this triangle library, which does a really good job of it. Um, it requires input of the segment indices. 
So I've done a bit of work here to figure out um, the start indices and the end indices of every single segment in the polygon, which as you can imagine for the 65,537 gon is a fairly large array of data. Um, but we're going to go ahead and use a triangle library to figure out um, the coordinates of the sentences, so the coordinates of the triangles, and we're going to plot those as a collection, a poly collection in matplotlib on these, on these plots below. Um, so let's, let's activate the triangulation of Oregon. We can see, um, it, I, I've, I've told it to basically print out the, the number of vertices in the original data and also the number of triangles uh, that's, that are output by the, the constrained triangulation. And you can see that we go from 214 vertices to 212, which is n minus 2. Um, so that's good. And this, you know, this isn't necessarily the most well-behaved polygon either. It's certainly not convex because we have these sort of invaginations at various points along the perimeter of Oregon. But we can certainly see that um, there are n minus 2 triangles. So, okay, let's switch to the potentially even more pathological case where we basically have what looks like a circle with 65,000 plus vertices. Let's triangulate that, which might take a little bit longer to do, but not too much longer. So here, there are apparently 65,535 triangles. Now, I certainly don't believe that number by visual inspection, but again, because the neighboring, uh, or the, you know, the n plus 2 uh, neighbors on the perimeter of this uh, 65,537 gone, are so close together, um, the most likely situation is just that many of those triangles are so small that we can't really see them. Um, you can see that you know initially you start off with these large triangles and they progressively get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so you have some really small triangles, um, but nonetheless the computer can handle it quite well. And again, it's it's n minus two. So I think I haven't formally proven it here, but hopefully um, you know this this shows um, to you know a reasonable degree of confidence that it is in fact the case for both real world examples and for artificially constructed potentially pathological examples that actually this n minus two uh, number of triangles within a given polygon is actually a pretty solid uh, rule. Um, so that touches on the number of possible triangles within a given polygon triangulation. But actually an even more complicated question is how many different triangulations are there for a given polygon? And so for this we turn to the work of the Belgian mathematician uh, Eugène Catalan. And we're just going to uh, quickly define convex polygon because this is important um, for working with the upper limit and the number of possible triangulations. Um, so convex polygons, you know, this is again something where you can sort of look at it and you generally know. So this, uh, this, this polygon on the right here is clearly convex by visual inspection and this uh, perimeter map of Oregon is clearly concave because of the invagination here. But from a more formal definition standpoint, basically every pair of non-adjacent vertices, so everything except for direct neighbors, um, is a valid diagonal. So if we, if we imagine, for example, the vertices up here near the top left of Oregon, and then some vertices that are, for example, over here, the, there's definitely no valid diagonal, no valid line segment that would be considered diagonal by connecting those two vertices. So that's a sort of formal equivalent of our, you know, of our intuitive definition. And of course, computers can't just take this in intuitive definition, right? They actually have to have this sort of, um, this sort of explicit information um, to, to, to measure these kinds of properties. I think a lot of people sort of notice that it can be quite painful to, to get the computer to, to test for a property which is extremely obvious to, to the human eye by, you know, by visual inspection. So the Catalan number tells us the number of triangulations of a convex polygon with n plus 2 vertices which is a slightly confusing definition, but basically what it means is that if you get something like a rectangle or a square, the value that you use for n, even though n is four, because there's four edges and four vertices, the value that you would use is two. So we would have two times two factorial and two plus one factorial over two factorial. Um, now, I've defined a function which actually takes the true number of vertices, just because I find that definition a little bit confusing in practice. So for a square with this function, you would just say, you, you input four vertices, and then you actually have the n equals 
4 minus 2 calculated by the code itself, and it'll do the proper mathematics for you. Um, so I thought, you know, that let's, uh, you know let, let's be skeptical and test this with the you know, borderline pathological case of the 65,537 gun. And you can see from the previous calculation there that there was already quite a few, uh, quite a few digits. It might take a few seconds to run this. Uh, but basically, yeah, we're going to see what we get, and we get, yeah, we get a huge number here, huge, huge number. So it's a bit, it's a bit difficult to intuitively assess, you know, if that's reasonable for for this uh, for this for this polygon. But um, yeah, so so let's actually switch to the case of the the rectangle or the square, and here we can see clearly that the the output is two. So there's two possible triangulations. And just uh, this should be fairly obvious, but just to you know, just to confirm, let's go up here and look. So the we have the the input uh, rectangle, which can have two possible diagonals. So from the top left to the bottom right, and from the bottom left to the top right, and so that gives you one triangulation, and so two triangles from that, or one triangulation from the other diagonal. So it's two possible triangulations. So I think that's a fairly straightforward, intuitive confirmation that yes. You know, this is at least for these two uh, these two cases working the way we would expect it to. So yeah, as I've mentioned in, in the note down here, so that looks sensible. You know, it works for a case, a really simple case that we can verify by visual inspection and by intuition. And also, the, you know, the code doesn't. There's no error when it's trying to work with a huge number of of, of, of vertices. Um, but actually, the case is a little bit more complicated because these are both actually convex polygons. And if you were to work with a, a, a polygon that has a concave uh, a, a nature, then what you can o the only thing you can really predict there is the upper limit. Um, so you, you can say that um, for a, a convex polygon with the same number of vertices as your concave polygon, there would be n vertices, n vertices, and there would be uh, you know the Catalan number of triangulations, and that Catalan number is the upper limit. Um, so that would still be useful from a unit testing standpoint. So maybe you have some algorithm that you're testing to actually calculate the number of triangles, um, the number of possible triangulations that you can get from a concave polygon. But at least you know the upper limit, um, and that can sort of sort of serve as a useful upper bound when you're when you're coding. Now the next example, and the next um, actually potentially really useful example and, and classic example is the art gallery problem. Now this is a very well-known problem in the field of computational geometry um, proposed by Victor Klee in 1973. And it basically asks, what is the fewest number of stationary guards? Or you could also imagine uh, cameras that are capable of rotating 360 degrees. So we assume that these guards or cameras can rotate 360 degrees and see in all directions. If you can place them anywhere inside a polygon, um, you know what's the minimum number that you need to guard or to be able to see the entire surface of of the polygon or the art gallery or whatever you're whatever you're designing, um, and even from a practical standpoint, you can imagine you might have a wireless signal or some kind of signal that requires line of sight, maybe some kind of uh, uh, you know laser or infrared based signal that you want to have um, access to in all parts of a building, and you want to determine the the minimum, the most economical number of transponders that you need to cover your your full working area. Um, now, surprisingly, it turns out that many versions of the problem are actually NP-hard. Um, but um, it has been fairly established that the floor, so the largest integer that's less than or equal to n over 3 guards, or cameras, or whatever you're, you're setting up, um, are always sufficient and sometimes necessary to guard a polygon with this n number of vertices. Now, you sort of notice that this sort of very careful definition here. So this doesn't mean that this is the minimum number of guards that can uh, guard or cover that polygon, but it will always be a sufficient number. Um, so it, it's NP-hard to say, can an arbitrary number of guards guard a given polygon? So there's no uh, quick and easy algorithm available to do that calculation, to do that yes or no assessment. But we can sort of uh, we can establish a bound on the number of guards um, that can be sufficient, that are always sufficient. Um, now, protecting the exterior. So, if you're trying to protect a building from the outside, it's actually even more difficult. So, we can see that the denominator is uh, is actually smaller. So, we're, we're dividing the number of vertices by less. So, that means that we're going to need more, more guards or more cameras to cover from the outside. So, it's the ceiling of n over two guards. 
Now for this stuff, it really helps to look at examples and also to look at some of the more intuitive algorithms that have been developed to attack this particular problem. So starting off with a simple case of a pentagon, we have the maximum number of guards in a pentagon being the floor, 5 over 3. So it's the, it's the largest integer that's less than or equal to this ratio. So that turns out to be 1. And then the max odor protective arrangement is actually the ceiling of 5 over 2, which is 3. So this makes sense based on what we know from above. You need more guards to protect from the outside versus from the inside. So let's, yeah, I've just plotted the examples here to, to show us interactively uh, what we're dealing with. So we can easily see that for this, for this given pentagon, guard one, if this guard or this camera or this device is capable of covering all 360 degrees inside a pentagon, they're able to maintain line of sight to the entire area that we want to cover. So that, I think that again is very obvious to, uh, to a person by visual inspection. Now, if we look at the outside, the protecting of the outside of this polygon, the case is a bit more complicated. And um, so you can imagine, I've, I've shown one possible arrangement. Um, so again, we have our three guards can cover. But again, this is the maximum number of, 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 of guards. So we, it, could, it could be possible in some cases that you can use less. But this number will always be sufficient. So we always have to sort of, uh, to sort of check this if, if we can, at least for these simple cases where it's possible to actually see if it's intuitively sensible that the result that we get um, is the minimum. So here we can see that guard one can, can, can cover these two edges here. Guard three is only covering this edge here, and guard two is covering these two edges here. But now imagine if we moved guard three up to above this middle vertex here, you know, way up here. Then this guard or this camera could easily have line of sight to this edge here and this edge here, giving us uh, an extra edge for that guard. But I think if you imagine trying to move any of these guards in such a way that they cover uh, more than two edges, you'll start to get into trouble. And I think it's actually not possible, as far as I can tell, to go less than the, than the three that's suggested as the uh, sort of always sufficient number. Uh, but there are cases where there will be deviation there, so it'll suggest that you know, four or five or six guards is sufficient, but actually you can, you can use, say, one or two less than the maximum um, the maximum value that we know exists based on the floor and the ceiling algorithms. So again, you know that that minimum for any arbitrary polygon is an NP-hard problem. So let's move to a case where it actually gets so moving beyond uh, n equals five, so beyond the pentagon, is where the deviations actually are known to start to happen. Um, so we now have a hexagon art gallery. And the maximum of guards to guard the inside, the whole inside space, is two. But already you should be thinking, hmm, you know, for this sort of for a regular hexagon, if you just put a guard in the middle, then that, that maximum isn't really needed, is it? So we go down here and we see that there are, I'm just going to remove these triangulations initially. We see that there's this, this hexagon here. Imagine putting a guard inside there that guard would easily, because, you know, again, within the constraints of our problem, this guard, this camera can move around 360 degrees, clear by visual inspection that that one guard can absolutely cover the entire perimeter of this system. Now on the right, it's a bit less obvious if we can get away with one guard, um, and actually intuitively you might guess not. So if you put a guard over here, try to sort of see this whole area up here and some of this up here, but I think it's fairly clear that they're not going to have line of sight all the way into the cubby hole on, on the top left. Um, so these have the same number of vertices and edges, but they have different configurations. Um, so we can see that n equals 6 is sort of the, you know, this is a, a fairly simple case, a small case, where actually two different configurations with the same number of vertices have different outcomes, even though all this algorithm takes into account is n, so the number of vertices. Um, so let's take a look at the, this is actually, this is work from the mathematician, the American mathematician, Steve Fisk. There have been a few different uh, proofs of this, of these upper limits, and uh, Steve Fisk's is probably considered one of the most intuitive. So if we, we start off with his approach on the first uh, regular hexagon on the left here, what we do is we basically, we have a constrained triangulation. I think I've, yes, I've used the triangle library to perform that again. 
But the extra thing I've done here is actually made sure, and this is the sort of the fundamental component of this algorithm, made sure that every single triangle has its three vertices labeled with different colors. So it's a tricolor scheme. And I think you'll agree, if you look at all these triangles, that each of them has all three. So none of them, no triangle can have two of the same color. So this triangle has all three, this one has all three, this one has all three, and this one has all three. And it can actually be a bit of a pain to label that when you start to get up to a large number of vertices. Um, I think there are algorithms to sort of guide you in terms of how to set the colors for the different vertices. Um, but for our purposes here, it's relatively straightforward to do it in a manual fashion. And the way this, the FISC algorithm works is basically to say, okay, now that you've done the triangulation and labeled your triangles with these multicolored, uh, with these multicolored schemes, you want to count the number of vertices that has each color, and then the color with the minimum number of counts is the value for the sufficient number of guards. So here we have red occurring twice, green occurring twice, and blue occurring twice. So in this case, the number is two. So two guards will always be sufficient to guard a polygon with n vertices. And this is a really sort of nice, intuitive way to see how the algorithm works. Now, why does that work? Well, let's look at the blue vertices, for example. So this blue vertex is part of this triangle. So if you put a guard at the blue vertex, they're easily able to see everything within this triangle. If you put a guard anywhere within a given triangle, it will always be able to cover all of the area inside of that triangle. Now, let's look at the other blue vertex. This is a member of one, two, three other triangles. And so that means that it can cover the areas of all these three triangles. So these two colors, these two guards, are capable of covering all four of the triangles. So I think it's a very nice, and believe me when I say this, the other algorithms, the other sort of proofs, are way harder to understand. So I think this is the most intuitive um, approach to, to at least getting, maybe this doesn't you know, formally prove it to you, but I think it gives you a really good intuitive insight into how this, this limit on, on, on the, the sufficient number of guards is, is intuitively achieved. Now if we go over to the case of the second polygon here, again, triangulate it using this, the Python triangle library, which is an API to this, uh, to this excellent triangle library. Um, we get this nice triangulation with the same number of triangles. So again, there are four triangles. There's always going to be four triangles if you have six vertices in the polygon. And how many different triangulations are there? Well, again, we have two red dots and two blue dots and two green dots. So um, we have the, the, basically we have the two different, the two different possible uh, uh, guard configurations. So we have a guard here, guard here, guard here, guard here, or guard here, guard here. So actually, sorry, three different guard configurations that will always be sufficient. And again, if you look at the green ones, that means that we have this guard here covering this entire triangle, and the remaining three triangles are covered by this guard. Um, so in this case, you actually do need two guards because there's no way to cover this entire interior with just one guard. In the case on the left, actually, it turns out that a single guard is sufficient, even though the algorithm tells us that two is the sort of the always sufficient number. Um, so this is a nice demonstration that, you know, actually um, there is an intuitive algorithm that gives you at least an insight into how these floor and ceiling functions are, are working out. Um, now, once again, if, if we think about the 3D case, so move up to polyhedra, um, not all polyhedra can be tetrahedralized. So based on what we know about the intuitive solving of the number of guards needed for the polygons, for the polyhedra, because they can't be tetrahedralized, it's not that simple. And it turns out that even if you take every single vertex in a polyhedron and put a guard or a camera there, there are some polyhedra that are so convoluted that, that still, with a guard at every single vertex, wouldn't cover all of the surface area of the interior. So again, polygons and polyhedra can behave quite differently, um, but this is a really useful uh, sort of demonstration of a you know, classical problem and the Python tools that we can use to, to deal with it. So using the, the triangle algorithm for the constraint triangulation, and then also using Python as a sort of you know, a teaching tool. So you coloring these vertices different, different colors, and using that to sort of intuitively show how this, how this algorithm to, to, to get the, you know, the, the sufficient number of, of, of guards actually works out.